Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined once again by Dr. Rebecca Futo Kennedy talking about black people and ancient history. This brings me to my next question, which I want to pose and also give a shout out to a very special organization in Canada known as HAMA, and that's the Historical African Martial Arts Association. And this is also a special shout out to one of its main pioneers, and that is Adam Mary. Adam Mary, this is going to be for you. Now that we have experienced a variety of questions that are, in many cases, even if unintentionally racially motivated, I wanted to bring up an interesting and positive episode to follow these. And that is African foreigners in the classical world. Would you mind guiding us through the African experience outside of Africa? How common was their presence in places like Persia, Greece, and Rome? Did they obtain positions of power and prestige? And if so, can you give us some examples of this? And my point for this question is, is to hopefully dispel a very wide misconception that these great civilizations like Greece and Rome and Persia were somehow homogeneous. Could you guide us through that? Sure. So, um, I mean, first off, let's start with the fact that um, oftentimes when we hear of people, skin color and things are never mentioned um, and where they come from are only t sometimes mentioned or not. Um, so, you know, oftentimes it's like if we find inscriptions, this is how we can actually pinpoint certain individuals who might come from a, an area. We have sort of tantalizing hints of things like um, Terence, right? Terence's name, the, the, the Roman comic poet, his name is Terence Affair, um, which is, you know, a black man uh, from Africa. Um, what does that mean? Is Does this mean that he's black African um, or not? We do know that he was um, a formerly enslaved person and he'd been freed. The question always comes up of whether Augustine could be called black. So oftentimes the questions are really, we don't know the answers to whether individuals were or not. I think that we should consider that if someone is called by the Romans or uh, to be from Africa, that we can assume that they are in some way black or, I mean, obviously they might be of Phoenician descent. Um, what are Berbers? Well, Berber isn't actually a um, ethnic marker or a marker at all of skin color in any way. Um, it's, it's, that just isn't, isn't how Berber works. The word means like nomad or traveler or something. So I think we just have to, a lot of times it's guesswork. But what we can say is that there is lots and lots and lots of evidence that we have from classical antiquity, um, starting obviously as far back as the Egyptians, but well into um, the late antique world of people who we would call black African as being not uncommon, um, maybe more common in some areas than others, um, but not uncommon uh, throughout the Mediterranean and living lives like other people. One of the things that we don't actually can't answer is how many people who are immigrants in Athens who are called Egyptian are in fact black or not black. Um, how many people who are functionaries of the cult of Isis um, are what we would call black or not black because the iconography that we have intermixes people who would be considered black or not black together in the worship of the cult of Isis. Um, in Rome, in Pompeii, in Athens, um, throughout the, all the places where the cult of Isis was perpetuated, um, and the cult of Isis, of course, was everywhere. Um, and here I would actually point to um, a, an archaeology student I know. Her name is Bet Hux. She is, um, I believe, at Heidelberg. But she did a recent um, podcast interview on digital Hammurabi. So it um, might be good to link up where she actually talks about her expertise is in the cult of Isis and um, the representations of um, Egyptians and Aegyptica sort of throughout the, the Greco-Roman world. Yes, Dash, we know. Um, and, uh, and she um, has documented all this evidence that shows, you know, how widespread the cult of ISIS was and how integrated it was. So, but assume, we can often assume that the people who function as priests or priestesses of the cult of ISIS are in fact from Africa. And these are people who have high levels of authority. Um, just from my own work in Athens, dealing with uh, cataloging tombs of foreign women um, in Athens, we have lots of tombs that clearly show um, priestesses of the cult of Isis. And we know this because they're holding certain instruments in their hands. Um, and also sometimes there's an inscription that will go along with it. Uh, but these are high level functionaries in, in a major temple or a major cult um, in the Greek or the Roman world. 
And so this is going to be one way that we're going to see lots of Africans sort of moving out into um, the rest of the Mediterranean. And this happens fairly early. The Athenian cult of Isis came at the very, very end of the 5th century um, and was well established throughout the 4th century. So, so it's already very much established. And while we do see evidence of prejudice against people that they refer to as Egyptian, my favorite one being, it's a really great legal suit, lawsuit, but we only have fragments of it, so I don't think a lot of people read it. But it is the story of an Athenian man who falls in love with a, an enslaved boy, and he wants to buy the enslaved boy from his enslaver. And um, instead, the enslaver, who apparently turns out, according to the speech, turns out he's like in severe debt. Um, and his, the, 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 the father and brother of the enslaved boy that this Athenian citizen is in love with, he uh, apparently had been running a couple of businesses and he's in severe debt. And so the, the enslaver wants to get rid of him because if you buy the slave, you buy the debt. So they concoct this whole story to get the, this Athenian citizen to buy <laughs> the whole family. And then he can free them himself, right? And then how won't the boy be so grateful that he's been freed and then of course he'll love you but it turns out the guy is now appealing in the courts because he's saying well little did i know this guy owns like you know eight talents in debt and it's like this massive amount of money um, but now he the new owner is on the hook for and so in his attacks on the person he bought the the slave boy the enslaved boy and the family from he says you know he's a scoundrel he's a cheat and oh my god he's egyptian right <laughs> It's like the big, he's even Egyptian. Um, so we know there's like obviously some, some prejudice and tension there. But this is a guy who is clearly wealthy. He clearly um, owns a lot of property and has a life in Athens and is integrating with the citizens um, and is selling them property um, and is pulling one over on them. So they're, they're integrated into the economies and into places. And these, these aren't necessarily like big famous people, but they are in fact part of the everyday fabric of life. And then of course we have art objects all over the place that uh, portrait statues and things that are just of people who we would say have um, black um, African features. Um, and um, so they're clearly either dying and setting up their tombstones or they are part of um, military operations in various places. Um, we see tombs for them in, in Roman places. We also see um, on relief sculptures, sometimes when they have sort of soldiers lined up, we see people who might have specific features. Obviously, they're showing up in, in Persian um, documents, Persian uh, relief inscriptions and things. Um, so they, this idea that there are no black Africans in the Mediterranean world is laughable and that they weren't just living their lives like everybody else is laughable. Um, they experience the same kinds of prejudices that others. I mean, if you're in Athens, if you're not an Athenian citizen, you're, you're a medic and you are subject to being sold into enslavement, whether you are Lysias and one of the wealthiest men in the city and his family, um, whether you're a, a common prostitute. And whether you are a Greek or not Greek, they don't distinguish within the category. You're simply not Athenian. Um, and the Spartans are the same way, right? So this idea that um, people are being singled out for prejudice because they are quote unquote, you know, black or they're African um, more than anybody else in a Greek structure, at least, is, is kind of, to me, uh, I don't see it anywhere. I haven't seen it in any of my sources anywhere. Um, what I see really is... Um, Athenians hating on everyone, <laughs> right? Um, and, and again, if you're a Roman, if you do, you know, one, I think one of the assumptions is, so, so here's a data point that I learned from Caitlin Green um, on her blog. She does late antiquity, mostly in medieval period, but she did a, a, a study of um, the slave trade in North Africa through the Sahara um, in, the, in the Roman period. And we're talking six to eight million People moved um, at that time. Now, one of the things, of course, we have to be super, super careful for is never equate in antiquity blackness with enslavement. Um, that's just not how it works um, at all. Um, but we do know that there was just as much, there was a major slave trade coming out of the Black Sea, right? Scythians, um, Thracians, um, etc. Major slave trade in Gaul and Germany. I mean, where do you think Caesar got all of his money? He didn't. He committed genocide in Gaul, but he sold more of them into enslavement than he killed. <laughs> That's how he made all of his money was the, this 10 years of selling Gaul, the Gallic population 
uh, and conquer Germans into enslavement. So we're having slaves come from all over, but we do know about this major point of, of the slave trade. That was the Garamantes um, in North Africa who are the main um, slave traders um, and slave tra uh, enslavers. And they're selling people into, into the sort of broader Mediterranean market. So they're moving all over the place. But if you're in a Roman world and you get bought by a Roman citizen and you get freed, you become a citizen and your children become citizens. So this idea that there are no black African Roman citizens is also absurd, just based on the data itself and on you know, physical evidence of it. Um, and of course, we know of the Roman legions from North Africa being stationed up in Britain and in other places. And um, these are most likely many of them black. So um, they're, they're, they're not um, living some sort of invisible existence um, in the ancient Mediterranean. Um, now this is, uh, and here's where I would actually point to the work of Caitlin Barrett, who's at Cornell, and she's an archaeologist who works in North Africa. And she works on representations of Nilotic scenes, sort of scenes of the Nile in the Roman world. And of course, one of the things that you see very frequently is you see these wall paintings all over Pompeii, right, of pygmies uh, fighting with crocodiles and hippopotami um, by artists who clearly have never seen a hippopotamus <laughs> before uh, and think it's actually a horse <laughs> with like sharp teeth and big head um, that lives in the water. And so there is obviously this sort of fantasy that attaches sometimes to blackness. Um, one of my favorite sculptures is in the Naples Museum now, and it is of a, a black African acrobat. Um, and I can give you an image of that to show, but it's actually part of a water fountain. Um, so his mouth actually shoots water out. We don't know what the rest of the fountain looked like. Um, but so there clearly um, is a mark on um, blackness as exotic in some instances. And we know that in some texts, like in Petronius' Satyricon, um, that the idea of having a black slave was considered um, to have a black person who's uh, an enslaved person is considered um, valuable um, in many ways. We also know, though, that um, in Pliny, we're told that they're bringing up to Rome for display crocodiles and um, a, a baby hippopotamus, because Lord knows you cannot transport to Rome <laughs> an adult hippopotamus. They're like the most dangerous creatures alive. But the, Pliny tells us one time of a baby hippopotamus being brought to Rome and its handlers um, are there um, working. And these are not, as far as we can tell, these are free people um, who happen to be people who handle crocodiles and they sort of in the traffic of exotic animals for the Romans. Um, and so they're part of the sort of entertainment structure um, that comes to the city of Rome. So we have all these, this evidence of them being around. We also have evidence of them being exoticized. Um, and we do have some minor evidence um, of, of obviously um, of the idea of people being Egyptian or uh, Egyptians in particular uh, as being a sort of a slur on someone's name. Um, but we find those references amongst people who think that being a Spartan is also a slur, um, or it's like, oh my God, you're from Megara, God forbid. Or if you're an Athenian, right, you're like, oh my God, what's worse than being Egyptian is being Macedonian, <laughs> right? Um, so, so you have, you know, you have to take the context um, of where we see references to anti-blackness um, and, and recognize that you, you only have those kinds of prejudices if you're around people. Uh, enough to see them or oftentimes it's rooted in an individual bad experience like this poor Athenian citizen trying to buy a, a, a slave boy that he's fallen in love with from an Egyptian medic resident in Athens. Uh, so yeah so I would say one of the things we need to sort of take away is one the ancient Mediterranean is not a white space it's filled with people from all over that people who we would call black Africans are all over the Mediterranean and they are living lives like everybody else. They're merchants, they're entertainers, they're soldiers, um, they are shop owners, um, they, they are teachers, they are playwrights. Um, they become, of course, in the Christian period, they become very, very heavily um, part of the early Christian church. We know that Ethiopia, the kingdom of Ethiopia was the earliest fully converted uh, officially Christian kingdom um, in the ancient world. Um, and so they are part of the Christian hierarchies. Um, very early on. Uh, and so we see them everywhere. And so this idea that, you know, it's, 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 and it, like I said, again, this sort of impermeable boundary between the Sahara and, and North Africa and the Mediterranean is, is a false idea that doesn't work. And there's tons of evidence, uh, visual evidence and literary evidence to show um, that people were 
uh, that black people were all over the ancient Mediterranean and that most of them lived just like everybody else um, and weren't set off as um, rare or distinct. Or distinct. Mm 